Living Corporate is brought to you by Canaries. Let me tell you about Canaries. Canaries is a tech company formed in 2018 by black founders who experienced inequities in the corporate world like most of us in the workplace. They saw typical diversity initiatives, but knew that to create systemic change, diversity, equity, and inclusion needed to be done differently. They're still ahead of the curve, focusing on the E and the I using a data-driven approach. Think Canary in the Coal Mine. The name is a nod to the canaries coal miners used to bring into mines to determine if the work environment was safe or undesirable. That's what they do for companies. They help you find the folks you need to listen to, the canaries, who will help you diagnose, measure, and attack your DEI challenges. Canaries has your back. Check them out at www.canaries.com backslash employer. That's www.canaries.com k-a-n-a-r-y-s dot com backslash employer Living Corporate is brought to you by Black Men in Tech Black Men in Tech's mission is to elevate the voice of black men in the technology space by offering year-round engagement opportunities and philanthropic contributions for people in the black community the neighborhood In the tech industry, black men regularly struggle to access networking and career advancement opportunities At Black Men in Tech 2021, they are partnering with their allies to create a safer space where black men can share their experiences authentically. Through this effort, Black Men in Tech hopes to share knowledge that can be used by black attendees to overcome race-based obstacles, while also offering non-black allies the chance to learn how they can be more supportive of their melanated colleagues. To learn more about the Black Men in Tech conference that will be happening on June 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, check them out at Black Men in Tech. Dot com. That's B-L-K-M-E-N-I-N-T-E-C-H dot com. Black Men in Tech. What's up, y'all? Exact we live in corporate and we are here. Yo, this critical race theory thing. <laughs> I don't even know what to say besides saying it. This critical race theory thing, right? Like this idea um, that we're naming anything that seems to hold any type of um, oppressive group accountable for their oppression or that just speaks to any level of reckoning with the reality of racism, calling that critical race theory. It's just been wild to see in real time, right? And I have a wife who's an educator. And I live in Texas. So I'm seeing all this legislation, folks trying to pass, folks are passing, excuse me, to block teachers from talking about racism, from using the word race, um, black, blackness, black lives matter, not the organization, but the concept that black lives matter. It is, I don't know that. See, this is why I never watched The Handmaid's Tale either, by the way, because see, that stuff is scary to me because it was too close to reality. I just I don't know, y'all. But the point is, is that critical race theory, the notion that race uh, does play a part in the society in within which we live um, is not bad. Like, I don't I don't understand. Like, it's I come here really transparently with y'all just perplexed at the the reaches that whiteness will go to protect itself and uh, skate by accountability. That is shocking to me. It continues to shock me. And I know it shouldn't. Um, It certainly continues to disappoint me. And I think about the future of this nation. I think about these kids. I think about the youth that need to learn, that need to understand. And you think about all the ignorance that we have around race today, all the animosity and the harm and trauma that that ignorance creates, it's disturbing. And so, you know, what I want you to know listening to this is that Living Corporate exists as a platform to really name oppressive systems, um, to center and amplify oppressed, historically oppressed and marginalized voices. We exist to, to stand and be unapologetic in that work and to really decenter whiteness. And we're not decentering whiteness for the sake of decentering whiteness. We're decentering whiteness uh, through centering marginalized voices, right? We are um, embracing discomfort in our conversation. 
So shout out to the people that have been on Living Corporate, any of uh, any part of Living Corporate's network from the leadership range to uh, see it to be it to the access point to the group chat to the break room like shout out to y'all thank you um, for journeying with us thank you for participating and i'm gonna say this shout out to the white folks right shout out to the xander lorries of the world and you know and shout out to uh to neiman marcus uh <laughs> the team over there uh shout out for thank you like thank you for uh, coming on this platform, right? Like us having just frank conversations, not for conversation's sake, but to really engage systems and really talk about what your own institutions are doing to grow and shift and change. Like that's important. Like that's the part for me that invigorates me with this space is we're not rambling against the ether of racism and like the overwhelming reality of white supremacy. We're actually challenging and naming things. And we're talking to people who have been put in positions of authority who can actually affect those changes right we're not just rambling i'm just that that's the that's the part for me that i believe uh continues to grow our community and continues to uh, help us build the relationships that we've been able to build um i want to remind everybody if you haven't already we um if you haven't already listened to our leadership spotlight series with pfizer we did that official partnership Felt really good. Milestone for the organization of Living Corporate and the network um, and some great conversations that we had. So I want to make sure if you haven't go back and you check out the uh, the, the series with we'll link in the show notes. We talked to some incredible leaders there and uh, hopefully you enjoy those. Now, um, I spoke with uh, today, this week, uh, Dr. Uh, Kimya Nuru Dennis. Dr. Dennis is an, an activist, a sociologist, a criminologist, an educator and an evaluator. Uh, but really uh, cuts her teeth in, in educating, training, evaluating, and assessing for-profit organizations and nonprofit organizations. Um, and so because of this profile, she's uh, and, and her, her systems thinking approach, um, she's able to really look at the nuances of an organization and call out uh, the systemic barriers and challenges, right? There's a there's an intersectionality to her work and how she just sees everything again simultaneously um, while also respecting the individuality of each of those things she's analyzing. It's very, oh, it's very cerebral. She's a brilliant, um, a brilliant woman. I'm so excited and thankful that she was able to be on Living Corporate and that we're able to have this conversation with her. Um, beyond her raw intellect, what excites me about Dr. Dennis is and what invigorates me and encourages me is her boldness and frankness to name a thing, right? So she'll name, she will name you. And I, and I think it's important, y'all, like the day is soon coming. It's been here, right? The internet has like sped this up, right? Like it's, and not to say that like people weren't getting named and shamed um, or held accountable, right? Because shamed makes it seem as if they're victims and all like you, you're being rightly held accountable. People have been, that's been happening since, shoot, open letters and things of that nature centuries and centuries ago, millennia ago. But the internet has really like scaled and like accelerated the notion of calling people out on their nonsense, uh, for lack of a better word, because my parents listen to this podcast, uh, calling people out on their nonsense. And I, I really want folks to really understand that, you know, if you're out here operating in a way that is less than um, ethical, that the odds of you getting called out are exponentially higher than they were some years ago, right? And people knowing that, like, like you getting called out in a in a on a stage, right? Though, like the odds of that are high. And what I love about Dr. Dennis is, Dr. Dennis will name it. She will name the organization. She will name people. She'll name harm. And that's really important. I think about uh, at my last job. So we did this um, candid conversation on race. Right. And I don't know, between people talking about their favorite foods and talking about, you know, what their what their favorite music is and what shoes they're wearing for the day. A bunch of nonsense. At the end, they did a and a session and the Q&A session. Someone said we did this whole conversation about race, but white supremacy didn't come up one time. Right. In the in the wake of uh, the capital, the insurrection at the Capitol a few weeks ago, 
nationalism, xenophobia didn't come up at all. Like, like none of these things came up. And one of the panelists who is a black person, right? And would uh, consider themselves an expert in the space and would say that, you know, they are, you know, and looking at their profile, they would, they would have all of the trappings of uh, a real leader in the space said, well, I don't believe that using such direct language, uh, extremist language is productive. I believe it can alienate your audience. And that was disappointing to me, right? Like when I think about this moment that we're in, when I think about the the, the, the position that this person sat, uh, when I think about the stakes, we're, we're past the time of being cute. We're past the time of being coy, throwing stones, hiding our hand. We're past the time of um, speaking in riddles or parables. Now is the season to speak directly. The work is so vast. There's so much to do when you think about like the labor of racial equity and organizational justice. And as big and hard uh, as as laborious as that work is, it starts with accountable, honest language. It starts there, right? If we're not accountable and honest in our conversation, in our language, if we're not transparent and intentional about naming a thing, the thing, shout out to Neil Edwards, um, then we're not, then like we're not going to actually make any progress because how can you move forward if you're not naming the thing? How can you move forward in something? How can you move forward against the goal if you're not, you haven't named it? What's the target? What are we addressing? We oftentimes play this invisible game of like appeasing this mythical white person or maybe the white person who's in charge, who's in charge of you. I don't know. Right. But my point is, is that we can't do this work and also try to appease whiteness like it's not possible and it's insulting in this season. It's, it's, It's been historically insulting to be clear. Duh. But it and it is it continues to be insulting in this season to try to play both sides, right? We're not there. We're just not there. Okay. Um, And so I say all this to say, I love Dr. Dennis's work. I really appreciate our conversation. I appreciate our conversation off mic. Um, And I just shout out to her 365 diversity.com. Make sure y'all click the link. It's in the show notes. Learn more about her before we get to the conversation. We're going to tap in with Tristan. I'll see you in a minute. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. Today, I want to introduce you to the idea of the on-demand workforce. Many companies have had to rethink their entire approach to finding and using talent. COVID-19 has forced many companies to move away from traditional pre-digital era talent models toward more on-demand workforce models. They've begun embracing a more flexible, blended workforce model that allows them to expand or contract their access to specialized, highly skilled workers as and when needed. Harvard Business School and Boston Consulting Group surveyed nearly 700 senior business leaders to better understand their use of new talent platforms. Specifically, how those companies were using digital talent platforms like Freelance, Upwork, and Fiverr to access highly skilled workers. They found that more than 30% of business leaders reported using new talent platforms extensively, while another 30% reported medium usage. Nearly 50% of the respondents expected their use of new digital platforms to significantly increase in the near future. Knowing this information, if you're a highly skilled worker who wants to stay productive and in the workforce while also managing your work-life priorities, this option may be a good fit for you. First, you'll need to do a little research to understand what skills you possess that are sought after in this type of talent market. For example, IT, HR, marketing, research and design, and strategic planning are some of the top functions sought out on digital talent platforms. 
If you have marketable or niche skills in those areas, a transition to more freelance or on-demand work may be easier than other job functions. Next, you need to understand how to adequately market your skills on those digital talent platforms to attract top-tier companies and organizations as clients of yours. While this type of work is not for everyone, it can be a great alternative for those who are having issues finding work during this time, don't want to transition back into the office, or simply are tired of being tied to one company or organization. I'm going to link to the Harvard Business School article in the show notes on how companies can use digital talent platforms to transform their talent model, which should give you more insight on if you may want to make this transition. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. At Living Corporate, we often talk about how we as black folks show up at work and how these corporate power structures impact how we show up. But we know when work ends, we come home, log off, and have to show up at home for our families and communities. And as a black man, I often turn to Let's Talk, bruh, for the real, honest, and healing conversations on black masculinity, mental health, and patriarchy. Let's Talk, bruh, or LTB, is a platform that creates content around black masculinity and the impact of patriarchy in black communities. In other words, Let's Talk, bruh, is having real conversations that black men need to hear and be a part of. Let's Talk, bruh, creates interactive, healing, and learning experiences with black men and male socialized folks of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Through their content and community-based programs, Let's Talk Bruh seeks to reduce patriarchal violence in our community and provide support to those most impacted by patriarchal violence, specifically black women, girls, femmes, queer, trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people. Tap in at letstalkbruh.com. To be clear, that's letstalkbruh.com. So brothers, what are you waiting for? Let's talk, bro. Dr. Dennis, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. You know, it's a pleasure. You know, it's funny. I, I'm going to put myself on blast. You emailed me because um, we had initially connected about living corporate a year ago. Yes. And thank yes. you. Thank you for being gracious and reminding me that even though we connected a year ago, we ain't booked no time. So I'm glad that we finally were able to connect. And get and get you on the show. Well, thank so, you. Uh, absolutely. You know, speaking about the fact that it's it's it was a year ago that we initially connected. Like, talk to me about the your work and and how your work has shifted or changed, or just how you what your personal experience has been with the landscape and how it shifted and changed, if at all, uh, over the last year or so. Ooh, that's a wonderful question. As you know, that's a huge answer too, right? So. All right. In the past year, that has just been so interesting. I've done a lot in terms of personally with my shift from being an academic to furthering my community involvement and my other work. Shifted in terms of my own personal property, in terms of buying a house in Baltimore and everything. Shifted in terms of the COVID safety And at the very beginning of COVID, since I also specialize in health, there were places across the nation hiring me to do trainings, to have a discussion about COVID safety, COVID vaccine. And I explained to these places that what they think is going to be a simple way to reach communities to address health is not going to be quick and easy during COVID. Because a lot of these health places, they ignore, for example, black communities until tragedy strikes, right? And then they think they can just go to our communities and say, hey, learn about COVID, take a vaccine. And so during these trainings a year ago, a lot of these places, they told me they had it figured out. And I I told them, I'm not psychic, but I'm going to tell you right now, what's going to happen is the same thing for centuries. You think you have it figured out, because when it comes to underserved and underrepresented communities, including black communities, places, they think that they don't have much to learn beyond maybe one training, reading one book. And that's extremely disrespectful, but that's how they operate. 
And so a year later, what I oftentimes do is I'll contact places and I say, hey, it's been a year. Of course, you know, some places will say they learned a lot from me. They won't go into too much detail. But this past year has just been the same thing over and over again, just more virtually. Places pretending they want equity work, but they really want just quick stuff. And they really want to, they, they come into it saying they don't know, but then they have to defend themselves and pretend they already know. And um, so that's why the work that I do is based on outcomes. I do six month and annual assessments. I tell people, even if you don't want an assessment, understand what it means when you don't want an assessment as well. So this past year, I've just told schools, medical facilities, all these places that the things that they're complaining about during COVID are the things that particularly Black people have complained about for centuries. It's only considered a big deal because it's considered white people's confirmation of a problem. And white people's confirmation of a problem does not mean that the problem started when white people decided to recognize that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge part of it. There's so much more, but as you know, this past year is just highlighted things that we've always said that people just told us we were disgruntled, angry, sensitive, sensitive, unacceptable for change, victim mentality. We want to be oppressed. We don't understand. People are trying like, Whenever people complain about the schools, the health services during COVID, all this stuff, I just nod my head. The same as they did when they celebrated white people showing up to George Floyd protests. I just said, how, why are y'all always easily impressed by bare minimum stuff that will stop being trendy and popular in a few months? And that's exactly what happened with that as well. You know, it's interesting. The first thing you said, um, you know, as it pertains as it specifically pertains to um, outcomes and folks not necessarily wanting an assessment. Um, and the idea that something isn't real or an emergency until white people say it is. Mm-hmm. I, I'm curious, I, based on what I see you post, I see you write, my impression is that you're not one to uh to not educate someone in real time. So when folks say, you know, this is a big problem, like when George Floyd was murdered and all of a sudden, you know, a bunch of folks are coming out the woodworks and you're having these conversations with potential clients or existing clients and you, and you let them know, actually, this has been a a long, long standing problem. What's the reaction in real time? Hmm. Uh, Well, uh, the reaction is that a lot of places, which is why one of my models is not your typical diversity training. A lot of places, we particularly talk about places that even though they might have black people or indigenous people contact me, the decision makers are white people usually, or at least people who are impressed by white people because they white people can easily complain about them and fire them. And so when people, when I explain this to people, I just say that the first step is asking yourself, what did you choose to ignore until tragedy strikes? The work I do is based on preventive measures. So the first thing I ask them is, what did you choose to ignore? Now, a lot of places, they would rather just hire someone to do a diversity training where you spend two hours telling white people the definition of racism that's in the Webster Dictionary, right? Instead, I say, well, first, in order to make changes, you have to have an honest discussion of what did you ignore despite people begging you to pay attention And since you ignored that for so long, why should people really think that you're actually going to make some changes now just because you've done an official statement and you're hiring me to do an equity training? And by the way, my trainings are not just conversations. We actually talk about changing policies, procedures, doing program assessments. So are y'all really ready for that is what I say. Are you really ready or is this something you were just told that now you have to do it to get the white ally (laughs) t-shirt? So it's interesting. I'll transparently say I've yet to see uh, any organizations that I've had the pleasure to work with go in and change real policy, especially around like performance management. It's interesting when you talk about policy change, what are some policies that exist within organizations that 
you've seen often create inequity um, that are that are I'm not going to say easy fixes, but are fairly direct fixes that can create positive outcomes. Yeah. So there are two main examples that um, I look at. So one, when we're looking at schools, schools will claim up and down that they are just realizing the problems with the curriculum. Literally, we have centuries of indigenous and particularly black people who have said we need to change the curriculum, like literally, right? So when schools say they're just noticing the problems, their quick fix is to add a few books. Usually the books are still authored by white people. And Eureka, now they've changed the curriculum, right? And so I explain that that is not a change in the curriculum. Now, mind you, I specialize in curriculum development. I've done this work with libraries. It actually takes longer than that. (laughs) It's going to take some people being offended because you're changing how they've been told to define knowledge and education, right? You're changing because despite tens of thousands of years of knowledges, sciences, mathematics, arts, literatures, histories around the world, schools in most con- in white controlled parts of the world teach that white people either created everything or are the main developers of everything, right? So you can have a PhD in mathematics. You've never read anything about indigenous math, Aboriginal math, African math. You, uh, you might know some arithmetic mathematics, you might know some Roman numerals, but even within that, you read it because a white person's book was presented to you in classes. And so, so I explain that, like that's the example of you actually have to change more than a book, right? Uh, you actually have to change the accreditation and the politicians making the decisions. You gotta change the school officials. You gotta change the school board. You've gotta change the fact that most teachers, K through 12 in colleges and universities are white people, okay? You've gotta change all of that. I tell people, if everyone's happy, about the change you're making, that's because you're not really making changes at all, right? You're giving them a new hashtag for social media so they can pretend changes are happening. And then we're told to shut up and just be happy and pretend a change is happening. So the same things happen when you're talking to the medical and health facilities and professionals. They do the same process. They'll say we want racial equity work in our health facility. However, they won't take they won't change things like the diagnostical statistical model. They won't change the body mass index. They won't change the fact that their their college, graduate school, medical school, academic programs are based on European white health lessons. They won't change any of that. They literally will want something that just is tokenism. They'll put more black and brown people at the lead who are not really the decision makers and changing curriculum and changing policies and practices. And so that's how I explain the difference between having an idea, liking a theory even. You know, we talk about critical race theory. That theory is almost 40 years old and now it's become popular again because particularly white liberals and white progressives. There's nothing impressive about people arguing over critical race theory. And I wrote a medium piece about this. I tell people these are all surface level things and it's 100% based on white liberal and white progressive permission. Like black people, many of us have learned about these knowledges for generations that have been ignored by white people. And now in 2020, 2021, people wanna argue about a theory And I'm more mad that there are Black people who are joining in on the argument. (laughs) Like, there's some things that we as Black people have to really stop playing that game. If white people are saying, no, we're not going to include critical race theory in curriculum, guess what? A president of the United States and schools cannot prohibit you from including a theory. They can't, right? So I also explain when I do this work, that there are a lot of things that adults are pretending are possible, like prohibiting a theory, that are not possible. <laughs> like you can't tell children in schools to shoot for the stars, you know, and then you as an adult believe that a president and taxpayers can tell you not to include a theory. 
in curriculum. It's, so let's talk a little bit about that, though. And I, because I, to your whole point earlier, you said something again, like things don't exist until white people give it attention. I do agree with you that in clapping back or like, you know, writing a bunch of think pieces to talk about these things that we've already discussed and agreed upon simply because prominent white folks have decided that they're going to make it their problem is in a very, in a very grotesque way, centering whiteness again. And it's, it's, it's curious to me when we have these discussions and, you know, sometimes, and Dr. Dennis, I'm going to talk, let's, let's have the conversation, right? I, and like in this D, DEI space, there's like different groups. I feel like there's different tables in the lunchroom and a lot of the tables is like a bunch of cool kids or people just trying to, they, they're trying to get on, right? So this is a way they, they can build their cachet. So they tap into really hot button topics or things of that nature, and they're, but they're not necessarily progressing the conversation forward or operating in a in a way that that is intellectually honest. Because um, I don't understand why we're, why, what are we debating with critical race theory? The critical race, like, first of all, we've yet to really hear anybody like on the white majority who is like extra crit- who is, who are extra harsh or critical critical, critical race CRT adequately explain what they even un- what they even understand it to be like that isn't like we don't even hear we don't even hear so- sound arguments but we can't but a lot of us we will like just kind of react and go well no it's this and no of course we're ra-. like so okay like at a certain point I do believe there's value lost when we chase those um it's like almost like chasing the wind a bit. And it become it becomes it becomes a sort a sort of performative theater. Yeah, it's a hundred percent performative. That's what LinkedIn is based on. Uh, that's why I got banned from LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is just like any in-person platform where when they talk about inclusion, equity, diversity, justice, they intentionally mostly bring in people who are not going to make real changes. Like literally a lot of places will pay tens of thousands of dollars just to put somebody's name on something. And then it's a check off their list and nothing's being changed. And so LinkedIn is mostly that whole profit seeking place where people use DEI, DNI certifications, all that stuff. And of course the whole implicit bias those bias trainings are all part of that. It's it's not really results based. It's really profit based, which is what LinkedIn is based on. And so that's why I tell people that you have to understand that justice is not about automatically supporting the people who have a bestseller book. I tell people if if your racial justice work is a bestseller for white people, that means it's not racial justice work. Same thing if we're talking about gender justice. If a group of cisgender men are loving you so much that now they've got a book club for you, that means they don't feel the least bit that your gender justice work is challenging cisgender dominance and men dominance. Same thing if we're talking about LGBTQIA plus work. When the power majority who literally control practically everything are excited about you, then that means that they're way too comfortable. Like you're making them feel happy. Cause again, that's a whole ally t-shirt thing again, but you're not really changing anything about their power. So therefore there can never be equity if it's still based on the power majority giving you permission to exist in their platform. I am, I am increasingly wary of voices who to your language, the power majority like is ready to like involve and include because it's like how how much are you really pushing the how much are you really challenging the system if the system is so welcoming to you right right yes. and it doesn't and it's not it's not about even necessarily being unlikable because like I'm a fairly likable person yes you get, are <laughs> yes you are <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you like I, as likable as I am there are a bunch of spaces that like do not mess with me right like in terms mm-hmm. of like would not invite me to their you know their little whatever um and and that and that and that's that's because 
ultimately my ideas are disruptive. Like the things that I'm saying are disruptive to like, if uh-huh. I start talking about, like I went to, I'll never forget Dr. Dennis. Like I went to this, um, I was on a panel and, um, and I was talking about capitalism, patriarchy and white supremacy and how they actually, and how, and how they all work together to create like systemic disparate impact and, and, um, and harm for black right. and brown people. And boy, you would, you would have thought now, now I got a bunch of private messages after the event, but during the event, people were looking at you. I mean, it was yep. quiet. Yep. Exactly. Right? It yep. was quiet in here, right? It was quiet. And, and I think, you know, it's, we, we enjoy, it's, it's, it's like there's a certain level of um tourism, right? Like we enjoy talking about these concepts at like very, and, and very theoretical mm-hmm. and surface frames, but yep. we don't really like investigating policy systems structure we don't like talking about accountability we don't like talking about justice you yep. said justice a couple of times like talk to me about what does organizational justice look like when we say the term justice or organizational justice or we say deij like yeah. talk to me about what does justice really mean at work because a lot mm-hmm. of times people in the power majority i love power majority by the way I, i'm gonna start I'm, I'm crediting you right here count this as your credit but I That's, have to start using power majority because that yeah. is so That's, because <laughs> because 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 the power majority when they hear when they hear the word accountability, they automatically go to like extreme punishment, which I think is a function yes. of white supremacy culture. But like, talk yeah. to me about justice. Like, what does it mean? Yes. So first of all, power majority. That's that's old school centuries of social science. So, for example, black sociologists such as W. B. Du Bois. Oliver Cromwell Cox, Ida B. Wells, you know, these folks were doing this work before any of these catchphrases and acronyms existed. So that's what I'm based on. Black sociologists, indigenous sociologists, we have done this work back when people was being, our people was being lynched before this stuff could make people wealthy doing these trainings and stuff. So I always tell people if the only thing you can cite is a bestseller, and uh, you've got a certification for it, then I want you to learn the real work before white people started signing off on it and giving permission. And so when we talk about justice, it's exactly that. It's not justice if your work is based on getting permission from the power majority. Uh, So uh, I do this on, when when I teach as a professor, when I do presentations in communities, no matter where I am, I, I explain the power majorities. So as it pertains to race, that's white people of every nation of origin, ethnicity, culture, language, and religion that has assimilated into racial whiteness over the centuries, even when they want to deny that assimilation, when it is convenient to them because they want to escape accountability for white power and white dominance. As it pertains to gender, That is cisgender people whose biological sex matches a particular gender identity, and that's boys and men. As it pertains to sexuality, sexual identity, that's heterosexual people and overall sexual people, because that's different than asexuality. As it pertains to income and wealth, whether it's capitalism, communism, socialism, or any form of system, people who have any kind of wealth accumulated are the power majority regarding that. Language in many parts of the world, English, particularly what they call the King's English, white people basically, that's considered the language majority such that parts of the world that are controlled by American and European tourists, particularly white people, you can go to an entire nation where there ain't no white people really there and people are expected to speak the King's English to accommodate the tourists who are mostly white. Religion in Western Hemisphere, the religion majority, that's the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and that's, of course, Christianity, and that's not the original Christianity, but that's the white form of Christianity. That's the foundation of missionaries and and, uh, murderers around the world, murderers who present themselves as white saviors who stole thousands of years of knowledge, murdered people, raped people, and now they proclaim that they've actually spread knowledge and Christianity around the world. So, and, you know, we talk about health 
able health people, people who do not have a lasting form of mental illness, physical illness, those are the power majorities. So that's what it means when we say power majorities. Power majorities also include underserved and underrepresented people who help the power majorities. So that's why I always address this as it pertains to power. White people tend to be the most likely to complain when we're talking about power, and men also tend to complain because they feel like you're saying, like you said before, they feel very threatened in their power being removed. They don't really know how their power is being removed. They have this image that now we're going to put them into a form of transatlantic slavery or something like that. Um, it's really, it's a really extreme view because it's 100% based on this falsehood that white people saved us and rescued us from the continent of Africa and introduced us to faith, spirituality, introduced us to knowledge because apparently we literally were just in the dirt, not knowing anything for tens of thousands of years. And unfortunately, there are people who believe that. And there are people of African descent who believe that white people rescued us from a continent of just rape, murdering, and wars. Barbary. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I tell people there's tens of thousands of years of Barbary around the world, all around the world, right? Um, so, so that's when we talk about power, that's what that boils down to. So whenever people ask me to explain power majority, I explain it that way. And even after that explanation, and I mind you, I don't explain to everybody because most people, when they ask questions, it's rhetorical. That's their way of expressing outrage, right? So I pick and choose on social media and in person. Sometimes I'll tell people, here's a reading list. <laughs> a lot of people don't want to read, especially if it's based on centuries of Black indigenous writings. They, they really don't want to read. But that's how I explain power majorities. And some people still feel offended by that because in their mind, control and power, it's just what it is. And we just have to deal with it. And, you know, I don't believe that at all. So I just operate how I operate. And I tell people, you are more than welcome to disagree. You can be mad. I, white people stalk me every day, but you can't say, I never told you. You know, it's interesting, Dr. Dennis, we're in this season, you spoke about it a lot just now is th there, we do. I think that we have a culture, uh, like the culture, the culture that we, we live in is, it's predicated upon power, not necessarily um, ethics or even truth for that matter. Um, to the point where when sometimes you point people to readings or, you know, evidence, um, that's when folks get fragile and defensive. I, what I'm curious about is those that like, you know, you exist in a space where you do the work that you do. And, you know, you've talked about it in, in other ways about, again, you talked about being banned on LinkedIn. Um, you've you've also been retaliated against. You've been, folks have tried to dox you and and they stalk you virtually and, and, and physically. Like, what is it that you have to say, like, to this next generation of folks when it comes to, really being willing to risk something for true uh, justice, equity, and, um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say for, for true justice and equity. Like, I, I think there's this old, I'm, well, I mean, it's not old phrase, really, but old to me is like, you know, people say everybody want to go to heaven, but don't nobody want to die. Yep, yep. It's, it's like, what is the message, right? Like, is it possible? Like, does, like, is it possible for us to achieve the liberation we're looking for without without receiving some significant punishment on the in that process? Well, there's always going to be punishment. But what I always tell people is that injustices, inequities have existed since humans have existed, right? Tens of thousands of years. So we don't we can't ever get rid of stuff in our lifetime because the moment like let's say a school wants to change their entire curriculum, right? The moment they make those changes, there's going to be angry white people, including white employees including white school board members, including white taxpayers, white politicians, white people all the way around the world who know nothing, but they still are mad. So there's always going to be people who are angry. So I always tell people when you're doing this work, remember the thousands of years of people before you who are doing this work. And there's certain identities that did not exist thousands of years ago. So maybe centuries before you always learn who was doing this work before you and who's doing this work now. So that's locally, nationally, and internationally. I tell all people this. You're not the first person to want justice. Don't ever go on to this thinking that you're doing something brand new. Contact the people 
who are already doing this work, collaborate. It doesn't mean y'all are going to always like each other. You're not always going to agree, but find a way that you can help each other. There's so many organizations struggling for funding because when you're talking about social justice organizations, racial justice organizations, they're still mostly white-led, white-controlled. And you can think about some Black organizations now that are making money because white liberals are giving them donations and sponsorships. And so I always tell people, you just have to have that honest conversation. Why are you doing this work, right? Are you doing it to be famous? Are you doing it to become profitable? I mean, why are you doing this work? And if you're doing it because you really want to see change, you also have to be honest that a lot of changes you won't see for a long time. Like literally, you could do decades of work, get punished, abused, terminated, tortured by white people for doing this work. And I'll tell you, the black folk who you help in, many of them will leave you abandoned um, because that's one thing you have to also realize. The people within your identity, within your group, theoretically they support you, but a lot of people will not be there to help you. And you really have to build a support system to prepare for all of that. Prepare for the worst, because if you go into this smiley, like, I'm going to change the world, let's do this, child, you are going to be so left hanging. And the people who said they want justice, many of them are doing that for social media. They're doing that for whatever, but they really don't want anything that's inconvenience. They don't want to sacrifice. The same thing happens when you're talking to medical professionals when you talk about getting rid of police departments, changing schools, the people who theoretically support this, they have every excuse in the book. And these are not new excuses. They're literally excuses that have been used for centuries to not only distract changes, but to blame you for having the audacity to hope that people really are not just running their mouths, but they're actually going to do something. So I tell people, you're not going to change everything in your lifetime because the moment you make a change, they're going to try to reverse it. But what you're doing is forming, forming a template so that people know that here's something to help you along the eternal struggle for equity and justice. I love it. I think we got to, we got to keep it right there. I want to shout out you, Dr. Dennis. Um, thank you so much for being a guest on Living Corporate. Uh, I'm glad we finally were able to make sure that we had you on consider you a friend of the show uh, and and look we're not going to wait a year to get you back on here okay oh. I'm gonna, all right so i'm gonna do what i need to do i'm gonna respond okay i'm gonna take care of that we got better processes now okay so, oh, so funny. well y'all have you all are doing a lot including the mental health work which is very important so i i appreciate what you're doing because you know when we talk about mental health it includes how inequities contribute to our health issues and that's something that 99 percent of health providers and health professionals are not equipped to handle. Some of them don't care. Many of them don't care. So I appreciate you all tackling that. Oh, well, thank you so much. And definitely shout out to Dr. Dennis, Dr. Hill, Dr. Coleman, and Dr. G Day, Dr. B. Oh, don't give G Day any clout. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go, my buddy, G Day. <laughs> Yeah, That's shout out right. to the break room. Yeah, for sure though. No, and I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, so let's do this. Uh let's let's uh we'll end it here and we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Living Corporate is brought to you by the Leadership Range, a podcast within the Living Corporate Network, hosted by globally certified and Fortune 500 executive coach and leadership development expert Neil Edwards. The Leadership Range is focused on having real, raw, soulful, and accountable conversations about inclusive leadership, allyship, professional development. Every week is a new episode with new learning and new actions to take on to grow inclusively. Make sure you check out The Leadership Range everywhere you listen to podcasts. And we're back again. Shout out to Dr. Dennis. Thank you so much for being a guest. Listen, y'all. Uh, life is to be lived. All right. Stop being scared. That's my message to you. Stop being scared. Right. Some of y'all are sitting on trauma and pain and harm and you don't want to say anything at risk of losing your job. Let me tell you something. Your mental wellness and your self-respect is actually more important. It really is. I know that sounds like a lot or sounds extreme to some of y'all. But those who know, know. 
do not sacrifice your identity, your self-respect, your peace for the approval of people who do not care about you. All right. These systems, they exist to exploit. Right. If you're in an environment, you're not getting and you're being constantly traumatized, microaggressed or macroaggressed. You can find another place to work. I promise the market is on fire. All right. You can find another place to work. Shout out to uh, Momentum. <laughs> oh, gosh, what a great mood. I'm going to be honest. We're going to talk about that, too. One of these days we're going to come in here. We're going to talk about how much better I am uh, in light of me uh, being in a new place. Uh, it's not even an ad. That's crazy. It's not even an ad. Just shout out to being in a, a healthy, uh, non-racist environment. I'm really thankful for that. And I'm telling you, it's possible. Make sure that you're prioritizing yourself. If you're seriously listening to this and you're like, nah, you don't really know what it is. And you're speaking from a position of privilege. First of all, you're right. I am speaking from privilege because I'm not in a toxic situation. I did find a new job. I am in a healthy environment. But what I'm saying is if you're listening to this and you feel like you're stuck at your job and you really want to find someone else to work, don't email Tristan Layfield. Tap in with Tristan straight up. Like you look, you heard a segment earlier, right? Tap in with him. <laughs> he literally does this for a living. Tap in with him. And if for whatever reason, like, you know, you can't get a hold of Tristan, email me, sack at living corporate.com. I will connect you with Tristan. I'll connect you with some other career coaches. Julia Rock, shout out. What's up? Talk to people. Like now is the time. Do not, do not in this season swallow disrespect, dehumanization, trauma in the name of acceptance or fear that someone's going to do something to you. These, no, they, they can't do nothing to you, right? They can't. They cannot. So I, I know I'm coming off uh, really direct. But I want y'all to hear me because I talk to people from time to time who are like nervous and they're scared. And I get it. Like, I really, really get it. I get it. But you have someone that's talking to you right now on this podcast and they're telling you to just prioritize yourself. If, if you've been looking for a sign or a message, I'm, listen to me. Prioritize yourself. OK. Tristan Layfield, hit me up. Right, I'll put the links in the show notes. Hit me up. Hit Tristan up. There's plenty of opportunities out there, regardless of what you're doing. All right. All right. Um, shoot. I think that's it, y'all. Um, look, tell a friend or, or a colleague or a coworker or somebody, maybe somebody that you don't like, I don't know, about living corporate. <laughs> um, every day. So you, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, but I'm a, I'll share it here. Our schedule has actually changed a little bit. So we have Real Talk Tuesdays. We have See It To Be It on Wednesdays. We have the Tap In with Tristan on Thursdays. And then on Friday and Saturday, we're airing we're airing audio recordings, reruns of um, from Living Corporate TV. Right. So we're airing the access point. We're airing the group chat. OK. Um, and so check it out. Like there's something for you here every day except Monday and Sunday. All right. We're, we're, we're cranking it up. Uh, I want to make sure that you're, that you're really plugged in with the group chat and the access point. Um, as we pick up those seasons later this month and in August. Okay. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to play some older episodes on the pod so that just in case, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of y'all don't even know that we even have like a lot, like we have a bunch of web shows, but we do. And so I want to make sure that if you haven't had the time to go over to living corporate.tv, um, that you listen to them here, right? They right here for you. So you can just play them right here. It's one less step. You ain't even got to work too hard. Um, I do hope that you check us out and get plugged in. And when I say plugged in, I mean like actually sign up so that you can be notified when the show's come back live so you can be part of our live audience because we do Q and A's. We do, you know, we're going to be spicing it up this neck, the next seasons, we're going to be doing giveaways and different um, collabs and stuff. And so I just want to make sure that people are prepared as we get going. All right. Uh, as we get going again, excuse me. Um, all right. Till next time, y'all, this has been Zach. Peace.
Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.